Chapter 12 of The Heritage of the Desert by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Echo Cliffs. When thought came clearly to him, he halted, irresolute. For Mescal's sake, he must not appear to have any part in her headlong flight or any knowledge of it. With stealthy footsteps, he reached the cottonwoods, stole under the gloomy shade, and felt his way to a point beyond the twinkling lights. Then, peering through the gloom, until assured he was safe from observation, and taking the dark side of the house, he gained the hall and his room. He threw himself on his bed and endeavored to compose himself, to quiet his vibrating nerves, to still the triumphant bell beat of his heart. For a while, all his being swung to the palpitating consciousness of joy, Mescal had taken her freedom. She had escaped the swoop of the hawk. While Hare lay there, trying to gather his shattered senses, the merry sound of voices and the music of an accordion hummed from the big living room next to his. Presently, heavy boots thumped on the floor of the hall, and then a hand rapped on his door. "'Jack, are you there?' called August Nab. "'Yes. Come along, then.' Hare rose, opened the door, and followed August. The room was bright with lights, the table was set, and the nabs, large and small, were standing expectantly. As Hare found the place behind them, Snap Nab entered with his wife. She was as pale as if she were in her shroud. Hare caught Mother Ruth's pitying subdued glance as she drew the frail woman to her side. When August Naab began fingering his Bible, the whispering ceased. "'Why don't they fetch her?' he questioned. "'Judith, Esther, bring her in,' said Mother Mary, calling into the hallway. Quick footsteps, and the girls burst in impetuously, exclaiming, "'Mescal's not there.' "'Where is she, then?' demanded August Naab, going to the door. "'Mescal,' he called. Succeeding his authoritative summons, only the cheery sputter of the wood fire broke the silence. She hadn't put on her white frock, went on Judith. Her buckskins aren't hanging where they always are, continued Esther. August Nab laid his Bible on the table. I always feared it, he said simply. She's gone, cried Snap Nab. He ran into the hall, into Mescal's room, and returned trailing the white wedding dress. The time we thought she spent to put this on, she's been... He choked over the words and sank into a chair, face convulsed, hands shaking, weak in the grip of a grief that he had never known before. Suddenly he flung the dress into the fire. His wife fell to the floor in a dead faint. Then the desert hawk showed his claws. His hands tore at the close scarf round his throat as if to liberate a fury that was stifling him. His face lost all semblance to anything human. He began to howl, to rave, to curse, and his father circled him with iron arm and dragged him from the room. The children were whimpering, the wives lamenting. The quiet men searched the house and yard and corrals and fields, but they found no sign of Mescal. After long hours, the excitement subsided, and all sought their beds. Morning disclosed the facts of Mescal's flight. She had dressed for the trail. A knapsack was missing, and food enough to fill it. Wolf was gone. Noodle was not in his corral. The peon slave had not slept in his sack. And there were moccasin tracks and burrow tracks and dog tracks in the sand at the river crossing. And one of the boats was gone. This boat was not moored to the opposite shore. Questions arose. Had the boat sunk? Had the fugitives crossed safely, or had they drifted into the canyon? Dave Nab rode out along the river and saw the boat a mile below the rapids, bottom side up, and lodged on a sandbar. She got across and then set the boat loose, said August. That's the Indian of her. If she went up on the cliffs to the Navajos, maybe we'll find her. If she went into the painted desert, a grave shake of a shaggy head 
completed his sentence. Morning also disclosed Snap Nab once more in the clutch of his demon, drunk and unconscious, lying like a log on the porch of his cottage. This means ruin to him, said his father. He had one chance. He was mad over Mescal, and if he had got her, he might have conquered his thirst for rum. He gave orders for the sheep to be driven up on the plateau, and for his sons to ride out to the cattle ranges. He bade Hare pack and get in readiness to accompany him to the Navajo cliffs, there to search for Mescal. The river was low, as the spring thaws had not yet set in, and the crossing promised none of the hazard so menacing at a later period. Billy Nab rode across with the saddle and packs. Then August had to crowd the lazy burrows into the water. Silvermane went in with a rush, and Charger took to the river like an old duck. August and Jack sat in the stern of the boat while Billy handled the oars. They crossed swiftly and safely. The three burrows were then loaded, two with packs, the other with a heavy water bag. See there, said August, pointing the tracks in the sand. The imprints of little moccasins reassured Hare, for he had feared the possibility suggested by the upturned boat. Perhaps it'll be better if I never find her, continued Nab. If I bring her back, Snaps is likely to kill her as to marry her. But I must try to find her. Only, what to do with her? Give her to me, interrupted Jack. Hare, I love her. Nab's stern face relaxed. Well, I'm beat. Though I don't see why you should be different from all the others. It was that time you spent with her on the plateau. I thought you too sick to think of a woman. Mescal cares for me, said Hare. Ah, that accounts. Hare, did you play fair with me? We tried to, though we couldn't help loving. She would have married Snap, but for you? Yes, but I couldn't help that. You brought me out here and saved my life. I know what I owe you. Mescal meant to marry your son when I left for the range last fall. But she's a true woman, and couldn't. August Nab, if we ever find her, will you marry her to him, now? That depends. Did you know she intended to run? I never dreamed of it. I learned it only at the last moment. I met her on the river trail. You should have stopped her. Hare maintained silence. You should have told me, went on Nab. I couldn't. I'm only human. Well, well, I'm not blaming you, Hare. I had hot blood once, but I'm afraid the desert will not be large enough for you and Snap. She's pledged to him. You can't change the Mormon church. For the sake of peace, I'd give you Mescal if I could. Snap will either have her or kill her. I'm going to hunt this desert in advance of him, because he'll trail her like a hound. It would be better to marry her to him than to see her dead. I'm not so sure of that. Hare, your nose is on a blood scent like a wolf's, I can see. I've always seen. Well, remember, it's man to man between you now. During this talk, they were winding under Echo Cliffs, gradually climbing and working up to a level with the desert, which they presently attained at a point near the head of the canyon. The trail swerved to the left, following the base of the cliffs. The track of Noodle and Wolf were plainly visible in the dust. Hare felt that if they ever let out into the immense airy space of the desert, all hope of finding Mescal must be abandoned. They trailed the tracks of the dog and burrow to Bitter Seeps, a shallow spring of alkali, and there lost all track of them. The path up the cliffs to the Navajo ranges was bare, time-worn and solid rock, and showed only the imprint of age. Desertward, the ridges of shale, the washes of copper earth, baked in the sun, gave no sign of the fugitive's course. August Nab shrugged his broad shoulders and pointed his horse to the cliff. It was dusk when they surmounted it. They camped in the lee of an uplifting crag. 
When the wind died down, the night was no longer unpleasantly cool, and Hare, finding August Naab uncommunicative and sleepy, strolled along the rim of the cliff, as he had been wont to do in the sheep herding days. He could scarcely disassociate them from the present, for the bittersweet smell of tree and bush, the almost inaudible sigh of breeze, the opening and shutting of the great white stars in the blue dome, the silence, the sense of the invisible void beneath him, all were thought-provoking parts of that past of which nothing could ever be forgotten. And it was a silence which brought much to the ear that could hear. It was a silence penetrated by faint and distant sounds, by morning wolf or moan of wind in a splintered crag. Weird and low, an inarticulate voice, it wailed up from the desert, winding along the hollow trail, freeing itself in the wide air and dying away. He had often heard the scream of a lion and the cry of wildcat, but this was the strange sound of which August Naab had told him, the mysterious call of canyon and desert night. Daylight showed Echo Cliffs to be a vastly greater range than the sister plateau across the river. The roll of cedar level, the heave of craggy ridge, the dip of white sage valley, gave this side a diversity wildly differing from the two steps of the Vermilion tableland. August Naab followed a trail leading back toward the river. For the most part, thick cedars hid the surroundings from Hare's view. Occasionally, however, he had a backward glimpse from a high point, or a wide prospect below, where the trail overlooked an oval hemmed-in valley. About midday, August Naab brushed through a thicket and came abruptly on a declivity. He turned to his companion with a wave of his hand. The Navajo camp, he said. Eschatah has lived there for many years. It's the only permanent Navajo camp I know. These Indians are nomads. Most of them live wherever the sheep lead them. This plateau ranges for a hundred miles, farther than any white man knows, and everywhere, in the valleys and green nooks, will be found Navajo Hogans. That's why we may never find Mescal. Hare's gaze traveled down over the tips of cedar and crag to a pleasant vale dotted with round mound-like white streaked Hogans, from which lazy floating columns of blue smoke curled upward. Mustangs and burros and sheep browsed on the white patches of grass. Bright red blankets blazed on the cedar branches. There was slow, colorful movement of Indians passing in and out of their homes. The scene brought irresistibly to Hare the thought of summer, of long, warm afternoons, of leisure that took no stock of time. On the way down the trail, they encountered a flock of sheep driven by a little Navajo boy on a brown burrow. It was difficult to tell which was the more surprised, the long-eared burrow, which stood stock still, or the boy who first kicked and pounded his shaggy steed and then jumped off and ran with black locks flying. Farther down, Indian girls started up from their tasks and darted silently into the shade of the cedars. August Nab whooped when he reached the valley, and Indian braves appeared to cluster round him, shake his hand and hairs, and lead them toward the center of the encampment. The Hogans, where the desert savages dwelt, were all alike. Only the chief's was larger. From without, it resembled a mound of clay, with a few white logs, half embedded, shining against the brick red. August Nab drew aside a blanket, hanging over a door, and entered, beckoning his companion to follow. Inured as hair had become to the smell and smart of wood smoke, for a moment he could not see, or scarcely breathe, so thick was the atmosphere. A fire, the size of which attested to the desert Indian's love of warmth, blazed in the middle of the Hogan, and sent part of its smoke upward through a round hole in the roof. Eschatah, with blanket over his shoulders, his lean black head bent, sat near the fire. 
He noted the entrance of his visitors, but immediately resumed his meditative posture and appeared to be unaware of their presence. Hare followed August's example, sitting down and speaking no word. His eyes, however, roved discreetly to and fro. Eschatah's three wives presented great difference in age and appearance. The eldest was a wrinkled, parchment-skinned old hag who sat sightless before the fire. The next was a solid square squaw, employed in the task of combing a naked boy's hair with a comb made of stiff, thin roots tied tightly into a round bunch. Judging from the youngster's action and grimaces, this combing process was not a pleasant one. The third wife, much younger, had a comely face and long braids of black hair of which, evidently, she was proud. She leaned on her knees over a flat slab of rock, holding in her hands a long oval stone. She rolled and mashed corn in the meal. There were young braves, handsome in their bronze-skinned way, with bands binding their straight thick hair, silver rings in their ears, silver bracelets on their wrists, silver buttons on their moccasins. There were girls who looked up from their blanket weaving with shy curiosity, and then turned to their frames, strung with long threads. Under their nimble fingers, the wool-carrying needles slipped in and out, and the colored stripes grew apace. Then there were the younger boys and girls, all bright-eyed and curious, and babies sleeping on blankets. Where the walls and ceilings were not covered with buckskin garments, weapons and blankets, Hare saw the white wood ribs of the Hogan structure. It was a work of art, this circular house of forked logs and branches, interwoven into a dome, arched and strong, and all covered and cemented with clay. At a touch of August's hand, Hare turned to the old chief and awaited his speech. It came with the uplifting of Eschatah's head and the offering of his hand in the white man's salute. August's replies were slow and labored. He could not speak the Navajo language fluently, but he understood it. The white prophet is welcome, was the chief's greeting. Does he come for sheep or braves or to honor the Navajo in his home? Eschatah, he seeks the flower of the desert, replied August Nab. Mescal has left him. Her trail leads to the bitter waters under the cliff and then is as a bird's. Eschatah has waited, yet Mescal has not come to him. She has not been here? Mescal's shadow has not gladdened the Navajo's door. She has climbed the crags or wandered into the canyons. The White Father loves her. He must find her. Eschatah's braves and mustangs are for his friend's use. The Navajo will find her if she is not as the grain of drifting sand. But is the white prophet wise in his years? Let the flower of the desert take root in the soil of her forefathers. Eschatah's wisdom is great, but he thinks only of Indian blood. Mescal is half white, and her ways have been the ways of the white man. Nor does Eschatah think of the white man's love. The desert has called. Where is the white prophet's vision? White blood and red blood will not mix. The Indian blood pales in the white man's stream, or it burns red for the sun and the waste and the wild. Eschatah's forefathers, sleeping here in the silence, have called the desert flower. It is true, but the white man is bound. He cannot be as the Indian. He does not content himself with life as it is. He hopes and prays for change. He believes in the progress of his race on earth. Therefore, Eschatah's white friends smelts Mescal. He has brought her up as his own. He wants to take her home, to love her better, to trust to the future. The white man's ways are white man's ways, Eschatah understands. He remembers his daughter lying here. He closed her dead eyes and sent word to his white friend. He named the child for the flower that blows in the wind of silent places. Eschatah gave his granddaughter to his friend. 
She has been the bond between him. Now she is flown, and the White Father seeks the Navajo. Let him command. Eschatah has spoken. Eschatah pressed into Nab service a band of young braves, under the guidance of several warriors, who knew every trail of the range, every waterhole, every cranny, where even a wolf might hide. They swept the river end of the plateau, and working westward, scoured the levels, ridges, valleys, climbed to the peaks, and sent their Indian dogs into the thickets and caves. From Eschatah's encampment westward, the Hogans diminished in number, till only one here and there was discovered, hidden under a yellow wall, or amid a clump of cedars. All the Indians met with were sternly questioned by the chiefs. Their dwellings were searched, and the ground about their water holes was closely examined. Mile after mile the plateau was covered by these Indians, who beat the brush and penetrated the fastness with a hunting instinct that left scarcely a rabbit burrow unrevealed. The days sped by, the circle of the sun arched higher, the patches of snow in high places disappeared, and the search proceeded westward. They camped where the night overtook them, sometimes near water and grass, sometimes in bare, dry places. To the westward, the plateau widened, rugged ridges rose here and there, and seared crags split the sky like sharp saw-teeth. After many miles of wild upranging, they reached the divide, which marked the end of Eschatah's domain. Nab's dogged persistence and the Navajo's faithfulness carried them into the country of the Moki Indians, a tribe classed as slaves by the proud race of Eschatah. Here they searched the villages and ancient tombs and ruins, but of Mescal there was never a trace. Hare rode as diligently and searched as indefatigably as August, but he never had any real hope of finding the girl. To hunt for her, however, despite its hopelessness, was a melancholy satisfaction, for never was she out of his mind. Nor was the month's hard riding with the Navajos without profit. He made friends with the Indians and learned to speak many of their words. Then a whole host of desert tricks became part of his accumulating knowledge. In climbing the crags, in looking for water and grass, in loosing Silvermane at night and in searching for him at dawn, in marking tracks on hard ground, in all the sight and feeling and smell of desert things, he learned much from the Navajos. The whole outward life of the Indian was concerned with a material aspect of nature, dust, rock, air, wind, smoke, the cedars, the beasts of the desert. These things made up the Indian's day. The Navajos were worshippers of the physical. The sun was their supreme god. In the mornings, when the gray of dawn flushed to rosy red, they began their chant to the sun. At sunset, the Navajos were watchful and silent, with faces westward. The Moki Indians also, here observed, had their morning service to the great giver of light. In the gloom of early dawn, before the pink appeared in the east and all was whitening gray, the Mokis emerged from their little mud and stone huts and sat upon the roof with blanketed and drooping heads. One day, August Nab showed in few words how significant a factor the sun was in the lives of desert men. We've got to turn back, he said to Hare. The sun's getting hot, and the snow will melt in the mountains. If the Colorado rises too high, we can't cross. They were two days in riding back to the encampment. Eschatah received them in dignified silence, expressive of his regret. When their time of departure arrived, he accompanied them to the head of the nearest trail, which started down from Sawweep Peak, the highest point of Echo Cliffs. It was the Navajo's outlook over the painted desert. Mescal is there, said August Nab. She's there with the slave Eschatah gave her. He leads Mescal. 
Who can follow him there? The old chieftain reined in his horse beside the time-hollowed trail, and the same hand that waved his white friend downward swept up in slow, stately gesture toward the illimitable expanse. It was a warrior's salute to an unconquered world. Hare saw in his falcon eyes the still gleam, the brooding fire, the mystical passion that haunted the eyes of Mescal. The slave without a tongue is a wolf. He scents the trails and the waters. Eschatah's eyes have grown old, watching here, but he has seen no Indian who could follow Mescal's slave. Eschatah will lie there, but no Indian will know the path to the place of his sleep. Mescal's trail is lost in the sand. No man may find it. Eschatah's words are wisdom. Look. To search for any living creature in that borderless domain of colored dune, of shifting cloud of sand, of purple curtain, shrouding mesa and dome, appeared the vainest of all human endeavors. It seemed the veritable rainbow realm of the sun. At first only the beauty stirred Hare. He saw the copper belt close under the cliffs, the white beds of alkali and washes of silt farther out, the wind-plowed canyons and dust-encumbered ridges ranging west and east, the scalloped slopes of the flat tableland rising low, the tips of volcanic peaks leading the eye beyond the veils and vapors hovering over blue clefts and dim line of level lanes, and so on and on, out to the vast unknown. Then Hare grasped a little of its meaning. It was a sun-painted, sun-governed world. Hare was deep in majestic nature, eternal and unchangeable. But it was only through Eschatah's eyes that he saw its parched slopes, its terrifying desolateness, its sleeping death. When the old chieftain's lips opened, Hare anticipated the austere speech, the import that meant only pain to him, and his whole inner being seemed to shrink. The white prophet's child of red blood is lost to him, said Eschatah. The flower of the desert is as a grain of drifting sand. End of chapter 12